I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. Hello, and welcome to Marketing Trends. This is producer Ben Wilson. Today's episode of Marketing Trends features an interview with Michael Mendenhall, Senior Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer, and Chief Communications Officer of Trinet. Michael has a really interesting background. He worked in marketing for Disney for a number of years, where he was able to lead marketing at a number of diverse organizations, including the Los Angeles Angels, Walt Disney Studios, and Hong Kong Disneyland, and eventually served as the Executive Vice President of Global Marketing for the entire Walt Disney Corporation. He has served as a CMO a number of times, including for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, IBM, and Flex. On this episode of Marketing Trends, Michael talks all about how to develop a world-class brand. He also talks about how to manage a marketing team, why communications should sit with marketing, and much more. Enjoy. Marketing Trends is created by the team at Mission.org and sponsored by Salesforce Pardot, B2B marketing automation on the world's number one CRM. Are you ready to take your B2B marketing to new heights? With Pardot, marketers can find and nurture leads, close more deals, and maximize ROI. Learn more by visiting pardot.com slash podcast or click the link in the show notes. Here is your host, Ian Faison. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at Mission.org, and we have in studio, Michael, what's going on? Not too much right now. Hopefully, shortly, there'll be a lot going on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you for having me, though. We're, uh, we're really excited to talk about your amazing career and, most importantly, the amazing stuff that you're doing at Trinet. So, full disclosure here, we are a Trinet customer, and so this is especially exciting to hear about the marketing and comms, uh, gears turning behind the scenes, uh, because we love Trinet, so uh, this will be a fun one. But first, how did you get into marketing in the first place? That's very interesting. So, I actually was an actor and went to school I didn't know for that. that. Yes. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> so I have a little bit of that in my blood. I started when I was very young, uh, performing at the Fulton Opera House, which is the oldest inland opera house in the U.S. I then went to school for that, Emerson College in Boston. And partway through, I guess it would be by the end of my sophomore year, I decided, you know, I don't want to do that anymore. I'd done that for over 10 years. Uh, I wanted to get into the business side of entertainment and media. That was an, a great school for that as well. There are many luminaries that have come out of Emerson. And so I went into that side of it. And partway through, I had enough credits uh, after my junior year uh, to graduate. So I did one half a semester in Europe. I left and went to Europe to start studying for an MBA in Brussels, Belgium. And I interned at that time with ITT. I don't know that that exists anymore. And that was in telecom. And then from there, I, I came back and went into a very small boutique sort of industrial design agency in Lancaster and worked on a lot of projects for major brands. Very young at the time, I think I was like 22. <laughs> um, it was sort of thrown in. It wasn't one of those where, oh, we have a training program. Yeah, uh, There was no training program. And it was like, you're going to be in business development. You have to develop business around this. And what they did was they were very early on in point of sale. So when you think about it, retail, all of the sort of displays that you see, whether they're cosmetic displays at a cosmetic counter, uh, whether you're going into Home Depot and their displays with Makita, et cetera, et cetera. And so I went and I started calling on at a very young age, uh, some of these major clients that were Fortune 500 companies and started to score some business, which was really interesting. And it was really all about um, how people shopped. And it was the psychology around that and how you begin to place certain things at retail at certain locations and drive more business and more volume just on placement, yeah. just on design, style, and color. Uh, and the one thing I learned there was like, oh, the lighter the color, the least expensive, the darker the color of packaging, the perception is it's more expensive. And so there were all of these psychologies that were built into analyzing how people buy product. And I started there and at that same time started to get involved in politics within the community Lancaster city and ran for office and won at a very young age and spent probably four years in politics, had my fill of that. But in that, in the process of doing that, I was put on George Bush's campaign in 88. Mm -hmm. He was running for president, being vice president as director of communications and got 
uh, a real flavor for communications in a much broader way than, than I had in the past uh, and began to understand the nuances all of all that. And from there, uh, I wound up uh, getting recruited by Disney and that was at Walt Disney World. And at that point, they really didn't have much of a marketing group. They were really forming a marketing group because it was really, hey, build it and they'll come. Yeah, totally. And, and, and they're like, oh, now we have some competitors. Maybe we should get a real marketing group, real advertising group in-house. And so was hired in as a manager there. And uh, then the career just kept going with Disney. You know, I was only there nine months and I was sent to Paris. And I was there three years in Paris. It's tough assignment. Yeah, yeah somebody I'm telling you it. I, I was like, are you kidding me? I have like a two bedroom apartment by the Eiffel Tower. This is pretty awesome. I think I was only like 27 at the time. <laughs> and so uh, we didn't have a whole lot of time to enjoy because we were opening Euro Disney. And uh, so it was a lot of work for the company. A lot of great experience. So flash forward to today. Yeah. Um, being CMO at Trinet, you know, Trinet is a company that you know, we talk a lot about tech companies and this rise of uh, of, of technology enabled services. Trinet does something a uh, super unique business model and a super unique company that when you know we were starting Mission I knew is kind of in the back of my mind that we wanted to use it. And can you kind of share just like why were you so excited about joining the company, being in this role, and, and what the company does to to help businesses? Well, I think I'll just sort of recap a little bit. You know, having been at Walt Disney. And in the roles I was in and leading up to being a president at the Walt Disney Studios, you begin to understand narrative content, the power of really great, high quality content and how people engage with and decide based on the quality of that content and very disciplined about that, very disciplined about the brand, very disciplined about how they would go to market. So for me, you had this whole background on content and we always were taught sort of by Michael Eisner Content is king. Yeah, of course. And, sure. and and we learned that at Disney, having, you know, bought InfoSeek, which was a precursor to Google and really didn't know what we were doing at that point, you know, beginning to realize what was happening with distribution. And that was really being driven by technology, right? So as these data centers began to build flash type technology into the data centers, really reducing the latency. So as you're streaming things, it's streaming in a really quicker way with higher velocity, uh, then you start to see what's happening with chips and the speeds at which things were feeding and the capacity that could be fed. You started to realize that, oh gosh, this whole business model is going to change and it's being changed by technology. And we certainly saw that, you know, Steve was very involved with our company at Walt Disney, Steve Jobs with the Walt Disney company at Pixar. We saw what he was doing and what he did to music and the music business and the music business model. We knew all the other areas of content, whether they were professional and or user generated, were gonna to start to shift the business models. And so I thought, you know, listen, if we really wanna understand what's gonna to happen to the future of content, just even like this podcast, you better really fundamentally understand technology mm -hmm. and, and, and at its core, not just, oh, we can do this, we can do that. Well, why is that? And where is it going? So like, what is gonna happen with cloud? What is gonna happen with machine learning? And what's gonna happen with artificial intelligence? And how is this all going to start to impact consumption, right, of content? And so I moved up to Silicon Valley and went into Hewlett Packard uh, under Mark Hurd and really got a very deep understanding of all the technologies, both present and future. And I began doing that. And through that, I got to get into a lot of startups. Mm -hmm. that we helped turn around, some we sold, uh, which is always a good thing for the people that are working in the organization, and some didn't do so well. And you begin to realize what, what builds a success. And it really has to do with one, the founders, right? And the culture that they've built and the importance of focus. So many get distracted either by their investors or get distracted by adjacency products that they think they should be in as well. And so it was like, well, you know, you can see what can build a success if you have a defined culture and focus. And it really was about the people that you've assembled to really make that happen. And so when I was introduced, I was introduced by Ray Bingham, who was chairman of the board at both Flex Tronics, which we renamed Flex. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was also chairman of the board here. And he said, I have a company I want to introduce you to. I think you could do some amazing things with this company. 
And so I met with our CEO, President CEO, Burton Goldfield, and I was really taken aback by his passion, his belief in what we were doing. And it was really all about the customer. And I thought, wow, it's interesting that it, it's a company that's not just about technology and it's not just about, you know, the algorithms that are sitting behind there helping. He really focused on the customer right away with me. And I thought he really has an understanding of what is important to business, I think, today. And so I thought I, I, I'll step in and I'm going to make this happen. Uh, and I'm going to help begin to make people aware. Like we had very little awareness when I came in. You know, unless you were in the inner circles of a, a private equity or venture capital firm, you may have heard of us or you would have heard of us via word of mouth from someone else. But there were a lot of people that if you said, hey, what do you do? I work at Trident. Well, what do they do? Mm -hmm. Right. So the idea of awareness was important. The idea of not a knowledge base around what we did was important because we're actually helping these companies succeed. And the way we look at it, because we're sort of the employer of record with these companies, they're our companies. Mm -hmm. So if they succeed, we succeed. So it's really a symbiotic relationship, unlike other businesses. Oh, 100%. In. It's yeah. aligned incentive. Yeah, correct. And so for me, that was exciting because we're in six different industries. And again, you know, when you think of the power of what these small businesses are doing, when 50% of the GDP comes from these businesses, 500 employees are under, this is where innovation's happening. And I get to see that, like going to Gritstone Oncology that's over in Oakland, mm -hmm. you know, and beginning to see what they have done to tackle using genomes to tackle certain types of cancers. It's amazing. Then you can go all the way to like a nonprofit like Hot Bread Kitchen in New York, who's actually enabling women who have been disadvantaged to actually begin to build a career is just really awesome to see. And then you get into the technologies of like an aspiration partner who's just reinvented debit cards mm -hmm. and just a beautiful program. And, and it's like, no one knows about these. Like when you think about all of these different companies, you don't ever hear about them. Very rare. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, the whole idea was one, we want to flip HR upside down and, and really make it about the people because it is the people that build the cultures. It's the people that make the difference that make the difference, you know, in our economy here uh, with employment, et cetera, and actually build a better future. We, everyone talks about it, but these businesses are actually doing it. And so for me, it was exciting to join this company to say, you know, let's, let's shift the focus, not on our product but in the services and solutions that we deliver and showcase our customers because they're our employees too. So anyhow, so that's, that's why I love this. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the ultimate case of, uh, you know, marketing outcomes, right? Is the outcome is around the company having the flexibility to give elite tier benefits to their, to their employees when they couldn't like, the classic before and after, like before, couldn't offer benefits or be competitive. After, we can offer, like here at Mission, we offer elite benefits that compare with, you know, a lot of other people at yeah, like the big company. Well, that's a good point. I should talk that. So so what we actually do is offer all kinds of HR solutions. And that is, you know, from onboarding to payroll, to taxes, to risk mitigation, to compliance, to financial incentives for retirement, all the way through to healthcare, right? So as a co-employer, we then do all of that through one tax ID, so we're one company. So it allows us to offer the benefits to a person that has five people, person that has 500 people, the same benefits that you could possibly get at like Google. Yeah, it's the same, it's essentially negotiating the same rates as like the size of IBM, right? Correct. It's like, Little yeah. little mission hit, sitting here, sitting in Palo Alto, gets to negotiate our rates the same way that IBM does. Correct. And like to the and again, like this goes back to the level of complexity, all the things that you well, just, and the offers. So so I'll just to yeah. interrupt you. Yeah. The offers because m most people that you would go to, you know, you would get one healthcare plan. Yep. That you could pick from, and the importance is because again, depending on your diversity of your organization, you probably want multiple plans. Well, if you did that, if you only had five people, you would never be given those. Yep. Now you have an option. You have options that you can offer your employees. And again, that's a major piece of retaining skilled talent. Absolutely. And I mean, we, 
I can tell you competitively, I mean, we're here sitting in Palo Alto. We're in the most competitive towel market in the world. And we compete toe to toe with everybody now because of like benefit stuff. But I think that it, it also goes to the level of complexity around, you know, like we have a show called The Journey that's focused on on small businesses, small business problems and telling kind of ways that they got around that stuff. And one of the things that's always so crystal clear of every founder or small business owner is around the fact that they want to focus on the thing that they started the company for, whether that is baked goods, whether it is some type of technology or AI or whatever it is, that's what they want to do. And they want to empower their employees to be able to do that stuff. What they don't want to do is sit there and submit 50 different tax issues with 50 different states because they employ people in, in all 50 states in the US. Like that is not what you signed up for. No, that's right. And it's and it's a part of business that you just kind of well, dealt with over it, the years. And it's becoming more complicated, right? So when yeah. you think of the regulations that come from the federal government, local, state, those regulations are changing constantly. For a small company to be worried about all of this, to make sure they're in compliance so that they're not fined, for being uncompliant is a big part of it. And so what we really basically do is take all that operational, uh, the whole operational side of your HR off your plate that you don't have to worry about it. We also assume some of the risk, mm -hmm. right? So there's, there's a bit of a protection there uh, because we make sure you're compliant, right? With these different, you know, local, state and federal laws. And that becomes a big piece of this. And that's why you then can focus on your business. You can focus on driving your business, not have to worry about that. And that becomes really important. There are a lot of very big tech companies and other companies within other verticals that have really grown. Um, and we call them, they graduate because they, yep. they get to like over a thousand or a couple thousand employees and they'll either pull it in house, et cetera, or self-insure. So we see them graduate. A lot of them have been with Trinet. Most people don't know that beyond meat who just went public is a customer of ours. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and, you know, we hope for that. I mean, we hope that all these people really make it or can sustain their business if it's a family business, you know? Well, and, I, and the reason why I think all of this is really important context for the listener is to me, I was, you know, six minutes into the pitch and I'm like hundred percent in I'm sold I you know, we want this. Uh, and this was years before we even started mission that I was like, at some point when I start my company, I'm going to use this. So then it becomes a marketing and communications problem because you need to clearly articulate this level of complexity, the number of SKUs, the number of options, uh, you know, confusion equals no sale. So in the marketing, like it really is a marketing challenge. And the way that you've looked at this, I think it's super interesting. So I'd love to talk about, you know, kind of what you think about, like, did you decide to go with agencies? What type of campaign did you want to build around this? Um, like, how do you view yeah. content and marketing and, and when you have a quality product like this that needs to be in the market? Yeah, so I'm fortunate, I would say, because I've spent, you know, 17 years in the media entertainment business and content and media, I understand it quite well, both the media side and the content creative side. Having produced a lot of programs, as well as we owned media and sold media, mm -hmm. uh, uh, being at Disney. And so, we'll get into some of that a little bit later. Yeah, but okay. I, yeah. So, so for me, I have not found a given agency that could provide me anything different than what I could provide to the organization. And so I've always built a team, not as if it's a marketing team, as much as we're a media team, because we are all about content short and long form, mm -hmm. whether it's static or dynamic, we are going to be all about that. It's all about our narrative. It's about the focus and consistency of the narrative. I learned a lot from Steve Jobs and Michael Eisner about that being highly, highly critical mm -hmm. um, to going to market and presenting yourself to a customer. So, you know, for me, I didn't really feel that it was necessary. We made some attempts, not so successful. You know, I've hired a team of people who have had senior jobs, some of them in media and entertainment companies like Viacom, et cetera. And so, you know, we, we can provide that level of input. But what I did do was I said, but we need some suppliers that actually can deliver the content the way we want. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, the, the current campaign People Matter in hiring AL Studios, Andy Leibowitz, you know, that was a relationship I had. I knew she had a skill set that would absolutely work 
for this campaign. We we went down. I used Gar uh, and Co, uh, which is the foremost motion graphic house in Hollywood. They do a lot of major feature films, museum exhibits, etc. And I said, you know, you've never been in the commercial world. And this was like five years ago. I said, would you consider, you know, coming into that world with me and help me? I have some ideas. And I, I want motion graphics to be involved in them. And you're the best at that. We knew Garson through Pirates of the Caribbean and mm -hmm. a lot of the films that he had done. And he said, sure, uh, let's do it. And he's been with me ever since. And he, he now has branched into just cinematography as well. He's just, the company's phenomenal. Some of the best editors. And so, you know, I, I pulled him in. And so we've done that. So here in Palo Alto, actually, <laughs> Peggy Burke, who many people know in the in the startup world here uh, has a company called 1185 and she does great branding work and I thought you know I need someone to help me package up the branding side of this not necessarily just the creative but package up the branding so we went and brought her in not an agency not a you know she's a graphic design branding company and so so we would I pull on these people to come in and help and then we would assemble them all. So mm -hmm. we would pull them all together in a meeting and saying, here is our brief, here's the campaign, here's what we're going to do. You know, this is going to be People Matter, this is going to be in black and white. And they're remarkable, right? And so, you know, you're not you're not hiring an agency that then hires them, right? And then marks up theirs as well as their their fee, marks up, you know, there's no they don't give you pass throughs, so you're paying on all of this. Yep. And I said, you know, we have a small budget. You know, a lot of people see this campaign and they're like, oh my God, the money. We, we have a very small budget. I've gone from big budgets to like $5 million and, you know, take take this new product to market. And, you know, you figure out how you're going to do that and how you're going to begin to build a campaign that has both earned media and paid media. And you figure out how to position yourself within these channels. Certainly, we have a lot of channels to choose from today. And you really start to utilize that and optimize it. And we have that capability in-house. I've hired very senior talent. We have senior talent with a very flat organization because <laughs> there's not a lot of people, but very senior, very talented people. And we direct you know, our outside suppliers who are very talented in given niches in what they do. And that has proven to be, I think, a great model for me at least and how I've structured, restructured these organizations for you know, what's to come. Yeah. You know, I, I think we've over pivoted, quite frankly, into digital. And, you know, everyone raced. They were late. Some of them are still late as brands getting into the digital space, but we've over pivoted. You know, we saw the transition of all kinds of capabilities for sales because sales was important. So all kind of SaaS based programs for that. Then marketing was last. And we got all kind of sad. We can do this. We can, we can give you all these insights. And I'll never forget, and I won't mention it, but I was at a major brand in the digital space who sells advertising. And, you know, they were so excited because we were three times the norm in engagement, you know, click-throughs in, in the B2B category. And they were like, let's celebrate. And I just stepped back and I said, you know, are we really happy with this number? Like 0 0.10? And they're like, Oh no, this is fantastic. It's, it's at least double and sometimes, you know, and I go, you're just a modern form of direct mail. Yeah. And they just stared at me and I said, I'm not about that. I don't want to hear about your clicks because you know what? You're going to commoditize my product. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Now this is a commodity and all of you guys either want the advertising revenue or like Amazon, you just want to sell. You don't care about the brand. You may say you do, but you really don't. So I'm more about engagement. So talk to me about engagement. Like talk to me about how many people clicked, saw it. What was the scroll depth in this thing? You know, let's get to some real metrics that actually matter. I don't want to talk about this volume play. I mean, you know, we talk about on the show a lot that like marketing is meant to be remarkable. Like you're supposed to engage with it in some way, feel an emotion and talk to someone about it. Preferably, you know, either your boss or your colleague that can- Or you share it. Yeah. Or yeah. Or you share it. I'm curious, how do you measure, you know, the ROI of quality? Because I think quality is so important, but it's something that in a 300 by 250 display ad, 
like what level of quality can you put well, into I think that you have thing? To, I think you have to to think about branding very differently. You know, I've always been about the brand's reputation and the idea that at a corporate level as a CMO and CCO, I worry about the company's value. And there's a value to the brand, right, in a company. And some people put that on their balance sheets. And there is a way you can begin to quantify that, that Interbrand, I think, has done a very nice job with the Interbrand 100. Every year they list the top 100 brands. They actually have tested their algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really interesting what their models are relative to what is a great brand and what's the value of that. And it was interesting in one of their latest diagrams, they showed you know the S&P 500, they showed the Morgan Stanley World Composite Index, and they showed the Interbrand 100. And it was very interesting in 08, the brands that were in the 100 versus the other indexes soared. So if I had invested $100 in their stock mm -hmm. in these different indices, and then the 100, the 100 top brands, the margin was massive. Interesting. And so so you start to say, well, there is something there. Now, we, we certainly do every year a brand survey that's more about reputation and we sort of benchmark ourselves, you know, relative to recommend, you know, a lot of different metrics in there. You know, would you recommend this? And that becomes important just to give us a benchmark, but we see it right away in the metrics. Like for instance, we look at like, if we do an out, out of home placement, eight minutes later, we look at all of the metrics that are pulling through on our website. Mm -hmm. Like the minute that stuff dropped, it was like, woof. And you can see the level of engagement then, right? We do that for radio. When we start radio, we start looking at what's happening relative to our other mediums, right? And is it impacting or not? You know, there have been a lot of metrics like that that we look at. We didn't and we don't, and we see a lot of response. We don't go and test our TV ads and we don't go test our creative. We really look for, did we engage somebody? Not did they click it, did we engage somebody? Did they pass it along? You know, did they, did they communicate about it? Has the media responded to it? You know, have we heard back from our salespeople? What do they say? What mm -hmm. are the customers saying? And more importantly, what are our customers saying about it? You know, and that has been a huge response for this last campaign. I mean, the amount of customers that have on their own, gone out on their own media, and have talked about this campaign, People Matter, has been remarkable for us. And it's not like we have to say, oh, could you give us a quote? Could you give us an endorsement? It was a natural endorsement and a natural amplification of our message because of the idea that works. We're looking at a lot of different channels. I'm, I've kind of jumped around a bit, but you know, whether it's radio out of home, online, we're looking at, did they engage? Not did they click, what did they do? Did they engage? And what are we hearing and seeing? You know, we monitor the entire web every second of every day around sediment, positive, neutral, negative, about communications. So we can see what's happening relative to the ideas that we're placing into the marketplace and whether we've struck a chord uh, with our customers. Do you, and, and, you know, Labor Day just just passed, so uh, it's kind of the right timing to be talking about the People Matter campaign. I'm, could you just go into like a little bit of of detail about like why this is you know a huge campaign that's already been hugely successful? So I'm just curious, like, what do you think kind of made this feel right? Well, I think it was the authenticity, right? You know, again, it goes back to content is king, and you know, a great narrative, and I think it was real, and that's what we've heard from our customers and from the public, like. That campaign, it's real. It feels real. It's not actors. It's as diverse as diverse can be because our customers are diverse. Yeah. We just went into our customers and shot their people. Mm -hmm. And and so you're seeing them, you know, and, and it's a reflection of them and it's a reflection of small, medium-sized businesses, you know, that make the difference. And I think the authenticity becomes really important. It's not, it's not like some hard sell, right? Which was, you know, we're fortunate. That's not a hard sell because we've, we really focused the campaign on the customer. And I think that resonated, like that looks like my company. That looks like what I do. And yes, it is about us. It's not about human capital. It's about people. 
Well, and I think that showing that you're going to take an amazing photographer to take the photos, you're going to have a director that is an amazing director, like all of those things, I think really matter too. And to your point about like not having actors, like just using your real customers. I mean, it's like one of these things, I think we're just going to look back in, in the past year and just kind of look at some of the things that have happened and just like, why did we ever do things in a certain way? Like, That's it just true. doesn't really make, like, it really makes no sense when you think yeah. about it, right? No, I think when you see the the commercial we did, you uh, hopefully you will find it humorous and you'll laugh. And these were just real people that we looked at and cast and they weren't actors. And we had a director that knew how to do that, right? We were very fortunate to have over, you know, I think it's over 12 different major pieces of talent, whether it be a photographer, a director, a musician, et cetera, come into this. And it, I think it was the power of the idea of people matter and mm -hmm. the idea that people really want to see us get back to that as a country, I think, and as, as, as humanity, you know, really bringing it together. And, and I think, you know, this idea resonated, like this is authentic. These are real people. This is, you know, this is something people want. And I think, you know, it struck a chord, quite frankly, in the American psychic right now yeah. that, really played into this idea. And so we didn't have to convince anybody, any of these, the talent that came on board to do this, to do it. They signed up right away. It was like, I'm in. And that wasn't through an, you know, right? So you start to think about, we had a, an award-winning director come on board. We partnered with the New York Times, said you're gonna be a strategic alliance. And they were used to very much like selling different types of digital space. And, and I said, we're gonna start very differently with you. You know, I wanna tell a story. You guys have this company called T Brand Studios that really knows how to produce sort of journalistic type content. And I, I wanna do something that's like a documentary mm -hmm. of, of these companies that's dynamic content, black and white. And so we started to work on this. This was an interesting conversation because they had a whole pitch that they were, they, they were doing. It was really well done. It was like the iceberg and you only see a tip yeah. because all these small businesses, no one sees. So they went through this whole thing and they were building the strategy and they came to this one line that says, well, this is the business of the unseen. Then they kept going and I go, stop. You don't need to go any further. And they're like, what, what do you mean? I go, you don't have to go, don't go any further. We have the idea. They're like, what do you mean? I said, don't, those two things there in the back, don't worry about them. The idea is the business of the unseen. That's a show, that's a series. That's an amazing idea. And that's what we're gonna do. That's like, awesome. what, what? I said, give me the permission, I'm gonna trademark it. So I trademarked it. Oh, that's great. And I go, okay, so we're going to that. Yeah, now let's define the idea around that. And we came up with this series that you'll see that was shot by an award-winning documentary filmmaker and just beautifully done. Award-winning, quite frankly, these, these will win awards. They were so beautifully shot. And the story was this. I said, I want it to be authentic again. And it has to be about people. This is about people matter. So we basically interviewed their entire team. We had questions. And the director interviewed all these people. Then he constructed a letter that was from his team, his people, to him or to her. And we wouldn't let them see the letter until we read, where they read the letter on camera. And before then we shot all the different people doing the different things they do, just like we did with Annie, but with video, you know, with film. And then they read the letter. Well, most of them choked up because they forgot what they had originally created. Yeah. Because they're in the day to day and the impact they've had on whether it was 50 people, five people, 10 people. And then at the end, we have them respond to the letter. And it is brilliant, just super brilliant. And then at the end, it just says, our tagline, incredible starts here, try it. And it's just so nicely done. I mean, these were ideas that we generated with partners who mm -hmm. normally don't do that. Yeah, They're like, what? Like, we're doing to do this. Yeah, we're gonna do this. And I threw them for a loop and we got to, so much a better place that those folks, I mean, if you talk to the people at T-Brand, they would be like, this is one of the best projects that they've worked on. 
I, it's such a it's such a great story because it really solidifies like you want a partner, right? You want someone that is there with you, but ultimately you need to own the narrative because you're the one who works yeah. with your customers every Correct. day, right? Correct. Like they don't work with your customers yeah. every single day. You have, you know, whatever, a hundred sales reps I will tell you, they, they, the New York Times was so, what was so exciting is they didn't say, oh, we don't know how to do that. Oh, well, that's not how we normally work. It was like, no, here's how we're going to do this. And they were like, okay. And so we shifted that whole, we buy media model to one of content. What do you think the difference between marketing and communications is? Or is there a difference? No, there isn't a difference. I think I, in the last, oh gosh, 15 years maybe, I would not take a CMO job without the CCO title. They're so intertwined. I mean, it's, it's remarkable because what happens in your financial earnings and the messaging around that and the executive communications and the communications to your employees, these are all stakeholders whether it's analysts, employees, investors that you're messaging to, that these can't be disconnected and it has to be completely aligned. That's one thing you know I learned from certainly Steve is simplicity of message and focus. Don't get distracted because you can really easily get distracted in your messaging. Yeah, And your messaging is your communications. I, I think marketing has completely changed quite frankly. Um, and it's just a misnomer. I kind of laugh about the CMO title. It's like, really? I mean, we're still CMOs yeah. um, because I think that has changed. And I think, you know, it's really moved into growth. I think it's more chief growth officer. Yeah. The um, amount of work that is put on the marketing organizations, at least in the companies I've been in, is far more than what you would have considered a CMO, you know, even five years ago. So, you know, for me, communications aren't, sort of segmented the way they used to be. It's very much like the old funnel model that looks like, you know, something you'd find in your kitchen, you know, is is old world, quite frankly. Yeah. And the media and the channels uh, and the technology has changed that. Mobility has certainly changed that. And so it's not a funnel anymore from the, you know, I think that was created in like 1840 something. Yeah. And so, you know, it has really shifted the role of marketing. And you have to be multidisciplinary and you have to really figure out the balance between creative and narrative and all of these channels and keep the company focused. And if you don't have communications, that's very difficult because you have internal communications, external, and they have multiple, multiple segments within those that you're, you're talking to. So to keep, you know, the company aligned, I think it's imperative that communications is tied into this organization. I think you're seeing that as a trend, quite frankly, where the two roles now work. They still have them separated by titles, but really it's just sort of one organization. Yeah, no, I, uh, Eric Reese, who wrote Lean Startup, uh, always jokes about like, are we sure we got the organizational structure of a company right in like 1920 or whatever it was? We're just sticking with it. You got HR, you got marketing, you got comms, you got all this stuff. Like it, it really makes no sense anymore. No, no. <laughs> I mean, and 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 it 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 also, you know, goes into some of the stuff that looking at re-architecting the future of employment and you know why things like Trinet are so important because you have to reimagine like what being an employee is. Like Correct. what being what does it mean and working? Where? Yeah. And where? Yeah. And like, if you have a fully remote team, if you have employees in other countries, if you have all this stuff, like company infrastructure and laws, quite frankly, are just not prepared for that. No. And so with that being said, it's like marketing's job is exponentially more, more complicated. I think you'll see, as I was talking about growth officer, I think you're going to see transitions. I also think you're going to see an interesting transition from what you would consider the growth officer or the marketing officer comes transition now into CEOs. And I think that will be a future, uh, a future trend. Yeah. I mean, we, we had a, a CMO roundtable where, um, Chandar, the CMO of Coupo was like the C, the M and the O, right? Like the chief. And then the M is for the marketing. We're all pretty good at marketing is being the chief part. That is the part that you need to a lot of times develop. And it's like, <laughs> when you develop the chief part, you're thinking about the business, you're thinking yeah. about finance, you're thinking about partnering with sales and, and finance and all those different functions. Well, I, I, That's what makes a CEO. Well, I find more and more my job is involved in strategy yeah. of the company. So I think if I went back 17 years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. 
now in the last, you know, 12 years for sure, whether it's through, you know, talking about M&A, whether it's talking about growth, all those conversations now involve what is the marketing officer job, but I consider that more a growth officer job. Yeah, we, uh, we've had a few uh, CMOs on here that have, have done exactly that. And one of the, one that we recently had went from chief growth officer to president of the company. So well, like, that's what I mean. There you go. That's uh, a trend. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I fully agree. Yeah. I mean, like the CMO or the, you know, CGO knows more about the company and more about your customers because they're controlling the dialogue with your customers yeah. than anyone else. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, arguably other than sales. I do want to touch on, um, before we get out of here, I know you have many things going on, so I can't <laughs> keep you uh, captive in the studio forever. Were there any takeaways of working with Steve Jobs or working at Disney with Knight Eisner or things like that, that just kind of sh helped you shape the oh, storytelling yeah. side of your brain? Well, or? well I, I don't know if some of it's just inherent, a piece of it, but that, that, that then gets developed. But at Disney, no idea, no idea was ever tossed away no matter how crazy it was. Hmm. And I'll remember after, I think it was the Athen Olympic games that we were doing, you know, I think it was, we had just started maybe dancing with the stars and they were gonna do a tour. And so that was kind of successful. And we had, you know, stars on ice, Disney stars on ice, that does very well. And so we were like, well, how do we take, cause there was so much hype around the swim team in Athens, cause yep. Phelps was competing. Yep. Young, and I remember it was Michael Phelps, Lenny Kraselberg, Ian Crocker, yeah. Brendan Hansen. And we were like, why don't we do Swim with the Stars? And we do a countrywide tour. So the minute that they land from Athens, we tour them to all the different pools throughout the country. And we do a whole community program with them. We'll trick out two buses, you know, with stuff on the, you know, images on the outside. And then we'll bring them to Disneyland and we'll build an Olympic pool down Main Street. And we'll bring some of the kids that won throughout the country in and they'll compete with the Olympic stars down Main Street. People are like, what? Are you people crazy? And we're like, no, we will get so much press from this, the tour and this event, we could never buy this media. And they're like, okay, so I, I went and worked with our engineers because there was all kinds of complications like with the weight of water and how are you gonna yeah. th th you put this on Main Street and, and then how are we gonna fill it with the water and then how are we gonna disperse the water because we'll ruin the sewer system. All of these things had to be worked out. I just stayed with it and we did it. And it you, you can still go online and yeah. see the images from this thing. We had the worldwide press there People were like helicopters, like shooting down yeah. at the pool. They had Disneyland down the center of it. And we had like three lanes, I think. And that's the type of thing. That's just one example of where Disney was like an idea factory, like a creative idea factory, like think beyond yeah. your wildest dreams. Think beyond and don't let anything get in the way because if it's a good idea, we'll make it happen. We will make it happen. I love that. And, and. You know, I also saw them where we invested tens of millions of dollars in something and Michael looked at it and he goes, this is subpar. This is totally subpar. And we're all stressed out like, this is not us. How did we get to this point? And I remember him saying, start over. And we started over and build up another whole program around it. It was never like, fire these 10 people. How do, it was like, this didn't work. This does not work. We thought it was going to work. It didn't work. And it was never to put anything that wasn't world-class in front of our guests, because we knew that the lifetime value of those customers was so, so important to us that we were not going to do anything that wasn't world-class, full stop. Steve Jobs was the same way, right? Never, ever did I ever see him on any of the Pixar films ever compromise. There was just no compromise. And if we had to, put more investment in, if we had to fix something, we would start over with that scene and we'd rework it again. And then at times you'd have, you know, multiple shifts working on this stuff to get it out because it had to be fixed. And if we did, if we did something, 
that we realized was a problem, we would pull it right away. Like this did not work what we, this is not working. And usually we wouldn't even go to market with it, but if we did, it would be pulled. But that's why and, you create and, timeless assets, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I learned world-class and you really set the bar high. I'll never forget Michael saying, you know, set the bar high because he said, even if your team falls short, you'll be far better off than if you didn't do that. And so I've always been one being very meticulous about the quality. And I, I myself will be in the weeds on things, even on like bars of music in some of the work that you would see from this campaign, I, I get meticulous about because it's just how Disney and jobs and a lot of the people that I've worked for as CEOs drilled into me. You know, you don't go out and say, well, the public will like that, but is that world-class? No. And we're going to fix it because the idea is you, as you talked about, it's about engaging your customers. You want them to engage. You want them to feel the emotion that you've created. You want them to love your brand. And if you don't do that, they're not going to love your brand. And you want them to tell other people that you love this brand. And that word of mouth becomes important. So it was a lot of that that I learned around content mm -hmm. and quality. You know, a lot of times this whole idea of move fast, break things to get to market. That was never the case of the companies I worked with yeah, or the CEOs I've worked with. You don't just go to market so you can be first and you have something that's subpar. Never the case. I and I think, that, I think that's going to come back to haunt a lot of the people in the tech community, this idea of moving fast and breaking things. I think we see, the, we, we see what has happened in the tech community with the chaos that's been created. And a lot of that is we move fast. And I just think for marketers, there's a fine line between experimentation and putting stuff out that's subpar, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like you can experiment with doing something thing, something for the first time and putting out something amazing. Yeah. And that impacts your brand. And I think we've lost track of that with all the digitization of everything we're doing and all the really, really short form stuff that we're doing. We've lost the idea that you're building commodities, guys. Oh yeah. I mean the, the short formism stuff is like absolutely insane to me. I'm yeah. like, it drives me absolutely crazy. <laughs> yeah. Like people are like, so, oh, they don't, they don't, uh, you know, people don't want blank, whatever it is, uh, long form. It's like people binge watch eight hours of TV in a weekend. That's yeah. pretty long form. So yeah. apparently if you make it good enough, they will engage with it. Like one other great story we did okay. is when we launched Tarzan, we went, well, two, we went to New York city and in Times Square, we had, and gosh knows all of the permits we had to get. We literally had Tarzan and his team rappel off of a skyscraper and did choreography on the skyscraper. It was like stunning. And when we came up with that idea, people were like, oh, you're never going to get this. Oh, you'll never have that happen. How are they going to do this? Are there people that do this where they can do the, the choreography off of a high rise build? It was fantastic. And the other thing was when we launched Hercules, we decided we would add the Hercules float to the electrical light parade, which is a big deal if you're a Disney file, right? Yeah. And that we would take it up Fifth Avenue and we'd take the whole parade to from Walt Disney World to Fifth Avenue, all of it, the music, everything. And we actually got permission and got all the buildings to shut their lights off. So Fifth Avenue went completely dark and we took the parade and we had close to like, I think it was like a million people that showed up to watch this thing. That's crazy. Uh, the press on that was like- I love Hercules, by the way. Yeah. Just such yeah. a great movie. Well, great, great, great music too. Such good music. Yeah. I, so, Phil Collins. I know. <laughs> you really can't, I uh, really yeah. can't be Phil, that's for yeah. sure. Well, we could, we got to have you back to tell more stories because <laughs> this has been awesome. Anything to, uh, everyone should check out Trinet if you haven't already, uh, especially if you're a, a growing business. Yeah, it's just awesome. Anything to plug? Any any final thoughts here? No, I don't want to plug, but you know, listen, I'm, I'm here to empower small, medium-sized businesses that you have a position in this economy and you're making a huge difference. And, you know, that's what we're excited about. And you're making progress and in a very positive way. And I think we need more positive news. And I think a lot of that will come from small, medium-sized businesses. Totally agree. Couldn't agree more. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you for having me.
Thanks for listening to this episode of Marketing Trends. Marketing Trends is created by the team at mission.org and sponsored by Salesforce Pardot. World-class marketers use Pardot to generate and nurture leads, close more deals, and maximize ROI at every stage of the sales cycle. Empower your marketing team to become revenue-generating superheroes and let Pardot's data analysis keep an eye on the bottom line. Learn more by visiting pardot.com slash podcast or click on the link in the show notes.